Hello and welcome to Electromagnetics 1. This is lecture number 22. Um, today we'll be discussing transmission lines. Well, first off, uh, what exactly is a transmission line? A transmission line, in the simplest case, um, consists of two or more parallel conductors used to connect a source to a load. Let's have a look at some, some common um, transmission lines here in uh, figure one. This is a, a coaxial uh, transmission line. You have an outer conductor and an inner conductor. Um, the second one is called a, a two-wire line. Um, you feed the circuit. Um, you, so you have an outgoing current in, in one wire and then a return current in the second wire. Um, the third kind is called the the planar line, again, two conductors, top and bottom, uh, feed and return. Um, D is a wire above a conducting plane. That will work as, as a transmission line also. Um, and uh, the last one is the, the microstrip uh, line. Again, you've got a top and a bottom conductor there as well. Well, it turns out that transmission lines may be modeled using um, circuit theory. Um, however, uh, the circuit parameters used in the circuit model are determined using electromagnetism. Okay, A transmission line is described in terms of its line parameters. So you have the resistance per unit length R, the inductance per unit length L, conductance per unit length G, and capacitance per unit length C. Okay. Um, <clears throat> three common uh, transmission lines are shown here in, in figure two. Again, um, we're just going to label some, some distances on here so that <clears throat> we can talk about these in a quantitative way. So here's your coaxial uh, transmission line. Um, this is the two wire and um, this is the, the so-called planar uh, planar line, letter C there. Um, the formulas for the resistance per unit length, inductance per unit length, conductance per unit length, and capacitance per unit length for the coaxial two wire and planar lines are shown here in table one. Um, so these are distributed line parameters at, at high frequencies. If you will notice, for instance, in the expression for the resistance per unit length, for the coaxial line, <clears throat> there's been some assumptions made. In this case, we're assuming that the skin depth is much, much smaller than um, the inner radius A and also the distance C minus B. Similarly, for the two wire line, you're assuming that the skin depth delta is much, much less than um, A. And similarly, for the planar line, you're assuming the skin depth is much, much less than um, T. Okay, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a nice handy uh, little table that you can refer um, to if you're working with a coax, a two wire, or, or a planar transmission line. Now, uh, how does this all relate to uh, electromagnetics? Well, all of these parameters really for the coaxial line are determined by solving Maxwell's equations and applying boundary conditions. So if you remember, um, uh, you can uh, use, use Maxwell's equations and boundary conditions to determine the resistance. Um, in, in electrostatics, we found um, uh, capacitances uh, in electrostatics. There was, there was a, a little recipe we used to find capacitance. In magnetostatics, we had a recipe for finding inductance and, and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> um, just keep in mind that if, uh, if you can't look up uh, these parameters for a particular, um, a particular transmission line, you can um, calculate them using the techniques that we um, employed in electrostatics and magnetostatics. So they don't come out of, of thin air, obviously. All right, now um, I've already mentioned this parameter delta here, uh, but let me talk a little bit more about what delta is. Um, there's a formula for delta, the skin depth in the conductor. That's 1 over the square root of pi times the frequency times 
the permeability times the conductivity, okay? So um, what is delta? Essentially, delta is simply um, how, it, it is the distance um, that it takes for a wave propagating um, inside a conductor to have its magnitude reduced by a factor of, of one over E, where that's the um, Euler's constant. So uh, it's a measure of um, uh, how far energy will penetrate into a conductor. And you can see it's inversely proportional to the square of the frequency. So as you increase the frequency, um, the skin depth shrinks. So um, practically speaking, what that means is if you have a conductor, if you have a conductor, um, the current, as you increase frequency, the current um, is concentrated more and more in a, um, a little strip at the very surface of the conductor. That's called the skin effect, and it's related to, to skin depth. Again, if you decrease the frequency, you can get the energy to penetrate more deeply into a conductor. Okay, well, we mentioned that we can use circuit theory to analyze these transmission lines. Let's derive the governing equations. First, we're going to consider um, an incremental portion of length delta z of a two-conductor transmission line. So here we go. We have, um, this is what's called an L-type equivalent circuit model of a two-conductor transmission line, okay, of, of differential length delta z, all right? So uh, again, <clears throat> remember, the transmission line has uh, resistance per unit length, inductance per unit length, capacitance per unit length, and um, conductance uh, per unit length. So um, you can make a simple mathematical model of a short length of, of um, uh, transmission line. So uh, in, in this case, we've got a length of, of length delta z. So um, the voltage as a function of position and time uh, is labeled here at, at position z, okay? And then the voltage here as a function of position and time is also labeled as a um, at the point Z plus delta Z. So you have the voltage at Z and the voltage at delta Z here, okay? Um, similarly, we have a current flowing here at Z and we have a current coming out here at um, Z plus delta Z, okay? And we would like to um, derive some equations that govern um, uh, the potential and and the current. It's not hard. We just use uh, simple uh, circuit theory here. So the first thing we're to do is going to apply Kir Kirchhoff's voltage law to the outer loop of the circuit here in Figure Three. Okay. So again, Kirchhoff's voltage law says that the sum of the voltages around any closed loop is equal to zero. So we have minus V of Z and T plus come up here, the resistance, which is per unit length, resistance per unit length, times the incremental distance here, times the current flowing, so um, that's from Ohm's law, that's the voltage dropped across this little resistor, and then we add in the voltage dropped across this inductor, again, to get an inductance, you take the inductance per unit length times the differential uh, distance, so uh, we have L times the derivative of this current with respect to time here, times delta Z, that's the voltage drop from here to here, plus this voltage drop, um, the potential at Z plus delta Z, all right? Uh, that equation essentially looks like this, where I've moved um, V of Z and T uh, to the left-hand side of the equation. So this expression right here is just from circuits one, and it relates um, the voltage, uh, the current, uh, and the voltage and the current together. All right, and that's from Kirchhoff's voltage law. And then, you guessed it, um, the next thing we're going to do is um, uh, subtract uh, this term from both sides. So it comes over here, divide both sides by delta Z, and 
take a limit as delta z tends to zero. When you do that, um, this difference here becomes a partial derivative. And uh, <clears throat> we get this first equation, which is the partial derivative of the voltage at, as a function of z and t um, with respect to z is equal to resistance per unit length times the current at z um, at particular time t plus the inductance per unit length times the partial derivative of that current with respect to time. So we started with um, <clears throat> circuit theory and we end up with a little differential equation again relating the voltage and the current. All right, the next game we play is we're gonna apply Kirchhoff's current law to the main node of the circuit in figure three. All right, so let's look right here. Okay, <clears throat> so um, right here at this point, we have uh, the current I of Z of T coming in, and we have two currents one current flowing down this direction and this current I of Z plus delta Z uh, leaving. So um, Kirchhoff's current law says I of Z of T has to be equal to that current plus I of Z plus delta Z. All right. That is what we have written right here. Yeah. So the current that's flowing down in this branch is labeled delta I. So I of Z of T is simply equal to delta I plus I of Z plus delta Z as a function of time. That is this equation. So that's an expression of Kirchhoff's current law, okay? Okay, well, <clears throat> what is the current down here? Um, what is this current delta I composed of? It is composed of the current flowing through the capacitor plus the current flowing um, through the resistor, okay? And the we were characterizing the resistance in this case as a conductance per unit length G, all right? So we come down here and we expand um, <coughs> this uh, delta current term. That is equal to, by Ohm's law, uh, the potential divided by the resistance that will get you the current flowing the resistor. So that's through the resistor, that's this term. Um, v of z plus delta z as a function of time, that's the voltage that's dropped across that um, parallel resistive element. And then <coughs> the current flowing through the capacitor, if you remember I is equal to C dV dt, that's where this term comes from, okay? Again, uh, move uh, this term over to this side, divide through by delta Z, take a limit now as delta Z tends to zero, voila, we end up with our second differential equation right here, again, relating uh, the current and the voltage at a particular point on the line, a particular position Z, and at a particular time T. Okay. All right, well, what can we do with equations three and six. What, what can we do with those? Um, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna assume a sinusoidal time dependence. So we're gonna pass to um, the frequency domain. So uh, when we do that, equation number three um, turns into this little equation where now we're dealing, remember, with phasors instead of time domain expressions, all right? so. Uh, let's look at equation three here momentarily. So the, the derivative with respect to ta with respect to space, I should say here, with respect to z on the left hand side, um, that becomes a total derivative once we um, pass to frequency domain. And this derivative with respect to time becomes uh, just simply a factor of j omega, if you're remembering from circuits. Same thing down here, this derivative with respect to space becomes a a total derivative, the partial derivative with respect to space becomes a total derivative with respect to z. And this derivative with respect to time, again, just simply becomes an algebraic factor, a multiplicative factor of j omega. So the first equation, equation three, becomes this equation in, in frequency domain. 
equation six becomes this equation in frequency domain. All right, so uh, we don't have to worry about any more partials with respect to time. Now we're gonna take the derivative of this equation here of seven with respect to z. And so on the right hand side, a um, derivative of i with respect to z will appear. We'll substitute for that derivative with respect to z, derivative i with respect to z from eight and substitute it back into seven. When we do that, we arrive at this equation that eliminates the current and we have a differential equation um, only for the voltage, all right? And um, we can rewrite this little differential equation. This is just an ordinary differential equation now in this form where um, gamma is the square root of this quantity right here, r plus j omega l times g plus j omega c. It acts like a, a wave number essentially. This is in fact a, a wave equation if you look at, look at it care carefully. Play the same song and dance to eliminate the voltage and we get an identical differential equation that um, governs the current, all right? Because these are wave equations, we talked about um, in previous lectures that they have wave-like solutions and, and specifically, <clears throat> the voltage can be composed of a positively travel, a, a, a voltage wave that travels in the plus z direction, that's this term, and a voltage wave that travels in the negative z direction, that's this term. Dittos with the current, it can be composed of a current wave traveling in the plus z direction and a current wave traveling in the minus z direction. Um, we know this one is moving in the plus z because we have the minus sign and this one moves in the negative z because we have the plus sign, et cetera, et cetera, in this sign convention. And all of these terms, they're just simply the amplitude of the wave. <clears throat> okay, the characteristic impedance z naught of the line is the ratio of the positively traveling voltage wave to the current wave at any point on the line. Okay, that's, that's the definition of impedance, right? It's just voltage divided by current. So we want to get an expression for um, <clears throat> the characteristic impedance. And it turns out um, if you take, again, uh, the positively traveling uh, voltage divided by the positively tra traveling current at any point of the line, it works out um, to be uh, this expression in terms of um, R plus J omega L and gamma, and this expression in terms of the conductance per unit length and the capacitance per unit length. We substitute in here for gamma from this equation. Then we can get an expression uh, for the characteristic impedance that looks like this. Now, again, in general, the characteristic impedance is going to have a real part, R naught, and an imaginary part, X naught. Okay, um, next three topics are the input impedance, the standing wave ratio, and, and power. So first, let's consider a transmission line of length L characterized by uh, wave number gamma and a characteristic impedance Z0 conduct, conducted to a load ZL as shown here in figure 4A. Okay, so <clears throat> this is pretty typical. Um, We've got a generator here that's creating some voltage. It's got its own generator impedance, Z sub G, and it's connected to a transmission line that is um, L units long, and it's terminated by a load characterized by an impedance, Z sub L, okay? All right. <clears throat> well, um, we're gonna be working with, with this model Um, so we're going to try to find the input impedance, we're going to try to find the standing wave ratio S, and the power um, that flows on the line. All right, first, input impedance. Um, let's let the transmission line again extend from Z equals zero at the generator to Z equals L at the load. First we need expressions for the voltage and current waves. We know from um, the previous uh, discussion that the voltage waves are, um, can be composed of a plus and minus traveling wave uh, 
and uh, so too the current waves can be composed of a positively and negatively uh, uh, traveling wave. Okay. Um, in order to find these two unknown amplitudes, V0 plus and V0 minus, we need to use terminal conditions. Okay. Um, so first we're going to use terminal conditions at the generator or at the input. And so we're going to require that at the input, <coughs> uh, the voltage, uh, this, this voltage is equal to some v specified V0. All right, and similarly, we're going to say that at the input, this current is going to be equal to some specified current I naught. All right, so simple equation there. We just at z equals zero, we substitute in um, v naught here on the left hand side, and uh, I naught here on the left hand side, and we go ahead and solve for v zero plus and V0 minus in terms of V0 and I0. And this is what you get when you, when you um, solve for those two quantities. You get an expression for the um, amplitude of the positively traveling uh, voltage wave, and you get an expression for the amplitude of the negatively uh, traveling, uh, negative traveling voltage wave, okay? We can play a similar game at uh, the terminals, okay? Um, I should say, if the input impedance at the input terminals is equal to V0 divided by I0, um, then from this figure, the second part of that, this figure right here, figure 4B, we can say that <coughs> um, the following has to hold, which is that um, V0 is equal to Z in divided by Z in plus ZG times uh, the voltage, generator voltage, and I0 is equal to um, Vg over the generator voltage divided by Zn plus the generator uh, impedance. Okay, That's just um, basically based on this little, <coughs> this little current, uh, this little circuit right here, just solving this, this circuit. All right. Okay. Now, we got all those expressions by assuming essentially terminal conditions at the input or at the generator. We can also assume some terminal conditions at the load. All right, so <clears throat> in some cases, you may know the voltage and the current at the generator, in, in which case you want to use the generator um, terminal conditions. In other cases, you may have specifications or you may know the current and the voltage at the load, in which case you want to use the load conditions, all right, the load terminal conditions, all right. So very similarly here, we're now we're going to say that the voltage at Z equals L, which places you at the, at the load, is equal to a voltage across the load, that a specified voltage across the load. Similarly, the current at the load is equal to a specified current at the load, all right. Um, again, we're going to substitute VL and IL on into the left hand sides now of these two equations respectively. We'll set Z equal to L. So you're going to see some phase terms appearing here now in these expressions because Z is not equal to zero anymore. And then we're going to solve again for our unknown amplitudes. And this is the expression that appears um, when you do that. We have an expression for the um, uh, positively traveling voltage wave and an expression for the negatively traveling voltage wave. All right. <clears throat> okay. So at the generator at Z equals zero, we can get an expression for the input impedance. That is literally the impedance seen at this point on the line looking into the right here at z equals zero. That's the impedance at that point. Literally, if you were to stand here at z equals zero, measure the voltage, measure the current, take the voltage, divide by the current, you would get z in. All right, and it can be shown that that expression, the input impedance at the generator, is equal to this expression, okay? Um, 
we're going to substitute for v0 plus and v0 minus from these two equations in here. And voila, here is an expression for uh, the input impedance at the generator. Um, if you want the input impedance at any point along the line, it's given by uh, this expression right here, where you've got, <clears throat> again, the wave number in there, and then L minus Z appears in the argument of the hyperbolic tangent. Okay. All right, next let's define the voltage reflection coefficient at any point on the line as the ratio of the reflected voltage wave to that of the incident wave. Okay, so um, here we've got uh, the reflected wave. That's the wave that's traveling in the negative z direction. That's this term. And on the bottom we have the incident wave. That's the wave that's coming in in the plus z direction. And so um, an expression for the reflection coefficient at any point z is given by equation 30. Simply the ratio of um, the reflected uh, amplitude to the uh, incident amplitude with a phase term, e to the 2 gamma z. You can also show that the reflection coefficient at the load, which is simply gamma at L is equal to ZL minus um, the characteristic impedance Z0 over ZL plus Z0, like that. All right. Um, that can be seen pretty, pretty straightforwardly by making appropriate um, substitutions. The reflection coefficient can also be expressed in terms of the reflection coefficient of the load. So if you want the, co the reflection coefficient at any point along the line, that's equal to this reflection, the reflection coefficient at the load times, again, another phase term. Okay. The current reflection at any point in the line is the negative of the voltage reflection coefficient at, at that point. Okay. So if you want the current reflection coefficient, just multiply the, reflection, the, re the voltage reflection coefficient by negative 1, and you've got it. Okay. All right, now we define the standing wave ratio to be the maximum voltage divided by the minimum voltage, which is the same as the maximum current divided by the minimum current, which is one plus the magnitude of the load reflection coefficient divided by one minus the magnitude of the load um, reflection coefficient. All right. Um, now let's say that we have a lossless transmission line that has a character characteristic impedance of 50 ohms. And let's further suppose that the line is terminated by a purely resistive load of 100 ohms. Okay, And the voltage at the load is 100 volts. Let's have a look at the standing waves, standing wave patterns that develop on the line. Now, <clears throat> what you're seeing here um, on this axis, you're seeing uh, beta L, uh, the wave number times L uh, in radians. Okay, um, as a, so that's what you're seeing. That's the quantity here that's on the horizontal axis, and on the vertical axis, you are seeing the standing wave that is set up on the line. Now remember, standing wave standing waves occur when we have a mismatch between the characteristic impedance of the transmission line and the impedance of the load. Here, the characteristic transmission line, characteristic impedance of the transmission line, if I'm remembering, was 50, and the impedance of the load was 100. And so some um, of the energy bounces off of the load and comes back um, down the opposite direction, down the, the transmission line. And you have the sum of a positively uh, traveling and a negatively traveling wave. That is, by definition, a standing wave. And this is what it looks like here for the voltage, we're looking at the magnitude of the voltage here as a function of, of beta um, times L. So um, <clears throat> this would be sort of the, the standing wave that would obtain for a very short length of transmission line. And you're seeing what happens as you, in this direction, as you increase the length of the transmission line. So the standing wave. Um, uh, <clears throat> the, stand, uh, the magnitude of the voltage decreases until beta L is equal to pi over 2. That hits, hits a minimum there. 
increases again until beta L is equal to pi and so forth sinusoidally. And so you have a swing of 50 volts depending on how long your transmission line is. Same here, you have a swing of about uh, of, of one amp for the uh, current that you would measure at any point on the transmission line depending on its, its electrical length. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, well, let's not forget that a transmission line is used to transfer, transfer power from a source to the, to the load. Um, the average input power at a distance L from the load is given by this expression right here. It's one half the real part of the voltage phasor at L times the complex conjugate of the current phasor at L. If the line is lossless, then the average power is uh, splits up into two terms. You've got this um, uh, magnitude of the uh, amplitude of the positively traveling voltage wave here squared divided by two times the input impedance. Okay, This is the incident power. This is the amount of power carried by the um, voltage wave that travels in the positive direction. Okay, And then that term times uh, negative magnitude of uh, the reflection coefficient squared, that is the reflected power. Okay, so um, the the uh, we could we could say that um, the transmitted power here is equal to that. In other words, this is the power consumed by the load here. It is equal to the incident power minus the reflected power, which makes uh, qualitative sense. All right, now let's look at three um, special cases here. And for all three of these, we're going to assume a lossless line. Okay, Let's examine first the effect of a shorted line. Well, what happens, um, again, where that just simply means where the load is now, uh, the load impedance is equal to zero, which, which corresponds to, to a wire or short. All right, So the short circuit impedance is equal to um, the input impedance evaluated when uh, Z L is equal to zero. That's minus J, that is equal to J, imaginary number times the characteristic impedance, characteristic impedance times the tangent of beta times the length of the of the line. For a short circuit load, the reflection coefficient at the load is negative one. Standing wave ratio is infinite. Um, Let's have a look at this graph right here. Uh, this figure is showing you the input impedance of a lossless line. And figure A here is the, sh uh, the case that corresponds to a short, when the load is shorted. All right, So if you graph that tangent function that we just looked like, um, it starts at 0, again, when the electrical length of the uh, line is equal to 0, and slowly increases and gets asymptotically huge huge here at pi over 2. As soon as you step, step over that point, it swings from plus, plus um, infinity ohms down to minus infinity ohms, increases slowly to 0, and so on. This pattern just, just increases. So that's what, it, that's what you can expect uh, the um, impedance of a shorted transmission line to do as a function of length. All right, now let's look at the case when um, the line is open circuited. That that corresponds to an infinite load impedance. Um, in this case, the open circuit impedance is minus j times the characteristic impedance times times cotangent of beta l. Um, in that case, when you have an open circuit, the reflection coefficient is positive one, and again, standing wave ratio is inch infinite. The cotangent function again as a function of beta L um, looks looks somewhat different when the um, when the line is of zero length the impedance is large and negative slowly increases up to zero at pi over two and then increases to be large and positive um, in this fashion peri periodically so uh, a short uh, open circuited transmission line looks very capacitive um, that's one conclusion that we can draw at any rate. Okay, now 
It turns out if you multiply the short circuit uh, impedance times the open circuit impedance, you get the square of the characteristic impedance. All right, So that's just another equation to tuck away. The last case I want to look at is that of a matched line, which occurs when the load impedance is equal to the characteristic impedance. In this case, it can be shown that the input, input impedance is just simply equal to the characteristic impedance. And so when you have the lines matched, when the impedance of the load is equal to the impedance, the characteristic impedance of the transmission line, the input impedance is just um, the characteristic impedance and the reflection coefficient at the load is equal to zero. So no, um, no energy bounces back, which prevents a standing wave from occurring on the line and the standing wave ratio is equal to one. Well, thank you very much for your attention and I'll see you in lecture number 23.